To upgrade this complete foundation to oil painting for you, um, not only by adding another disc but also another complete volume later on because we have so many more paintings now. But there's still a lot of value to be gained from the original film. So I'm going to start off with disc one with using nearly all of the original film and help I gave then, which gives you the very basics, and then we'll move on to the uh, at the end of the film to newer work in France and then across into Lincolnshire and to work that I've been doing across here. And I'm then going to follow up this film with a, a volume, a foundation on acrylics as well, because many people want to know how to use that. Not a huge difference, but there are some things that are pluses and some things that are minuses with that. Obviously the speed of drying and glazing and so on. So I think it's an important thing to do. And we can actually use the two together. Uh, it's quite important to realise you can paint oils over acrylics, but you can't paint acrylics over oils, so we shall be showing that actually uh, a little bit in this film and in the acrylics film of course so it's both ways round. So anyway I hope you'll very much enjoy following through the progress of the paintings I do and demonstrations for the first film and how my own painting develops on from that as well using different mediums, mixed mediums and so on. I'm going to go in more depth into some of these areas shortly in the older film but I just want to show you where I'm at at the moment. I tend to carry around an old wooden suitcase here with a uh, brushes cheap I use mainly filberts these days, that's the round-ended brushes. In other words, that's a filbert with a round end rather than flat end. And I do like these long-handled ones still, especially for oil painting, because I can reach out as I'm painting in a fairly impressionist technique most of the time. Try and keep your acrylic brushes and oil brushes separately. This is um, my set of acrylic brushes, in fact, and I have sponges the same for oils as well. And you can see in it I keep a rigger, a series of round and pointed brushes, short and long handled, and a fan and so on as well. But most of my painting can be done with these uh, long handled filberts. And I, all I need is a range of about five or six uh, sizes, and the same with the round brushes as well. <clears throat> and that will do me for nearly everything I want to do, any, any, any subject at all, in um, both acrylics or, or oils. As I say, it's better to try and keep two separate sets of brushes for either. I like these nylon brushes because they're um, a nice consistency. If a brush is too soft, it layers the paint on too thickly and clogs up. If the brush is too stiff and too hard, it tends to lift it off. So I find these intermediate brushes are rather nice. The paints I buy tend to be these larger tubes rather than smaller. It's more economical that way in the amount I paint. Obviously that works out better for me. A little jar, some white spirit. A sheet of Perspex is my mixing palette and another sheet as well for putting the paint on. Remember that oil paint can be frozen, so if I have a lot of paint on here, I can put it into a plastic bag away in the freezer and freeze it up when I'm going away and come back to it still to be able to be used. <coughs> Equally, if I keep plastic round it, it tends to keep it a bit longer as well. And then in my little suitcase, spare paints um, and so on, and I can carry everything in there, a piece of rag, my, my, my turps, brushes, all in there in one bag. Hello there. Well here I am at the Paradou, at last about to put together the beginner's foundation videos for you. Videos on uh, pastel, watercolours and oils. All of the basic techniques you're going to need. 
long videos, three hours, your money's worth certainly. Um, and it's going to mean that uh, you're going to see everything you basically need to know to do your painting in those mediums. I also ask you though to look at the uh, specialist video on drawing and colour before you look at the videos on pastels, oils or watercolours because there's so much there technically that will help you. If you can't do basic drawing or you don't understand basic colours it will limit you. It's not impossible but it will limit you at uh, using these uh, other videos on the specialist mediums. And to help us I'm going to use pieces of film from all over the world. Obviously I'm going to use things from uh, the parody here, the view behind me over different parts of the season in different mediums. But I'm also going to take paintings that I've done in situ from all over the world, from America, from New Zealand, from Scotland, um, and you'll see how it can be done on site. In, in detail, the fact that you can actually go out there and use these methods and techniques in almost any conditions. So anyway, without much more ado, let's get on, let's go and learn about painting, let's go and get you ready so that you're able to produce all of your own work and thoroughly enjoy. Take your time with the, uh, the DVDs, it's almost impossible to see them all in one go. I would suggest, well, by all means do that, but I would suggest that you take uh, the, them section by section, painting by painting, then take a little relaxation and experiment a bit yourself. Okay then, let's get on. Now oil painting, Again, I'm going to show you the colours in just a moment. Let me show you some of the brushes first. I do keep in a rigger brush in both oils and watercolour for very fine work occasionally. That's something I didn't show you, but it is a round, very long, fine brush for doing very long, fine lines, quite useful. And in the oil paints, because I'm a fairly impressionist painter, I tend to stick with my flats nearly all the time. And these are nylon flats. You can see they're flat one way, square at the end and they're great for just dabbing on the paint. You can use an edge to make a rounder point or a broader stroke that way or you can just paint with a blade. And I also keep in some round brushes as well. This is a medium rigger to do my finer lines and finer work like branches and twigs or finer portrait work. And I'll keep these flaps in in about five different sizes. Here's a smaller one and you can imagine with that I can paint quite fine areas. But apart from the brushes, well while I'm at it I'll mention it's not just nylon brushes. The nylon brushes wear longer and last longer, but you're quite adequate with the bristle brushes, the cheap hog hair brushes that you can buy in the market for two or three pounds. Great for painting with. They won't last quite as long, but they're quite adequate. We don't need really expensive fancy brushes. Now apart from brushes we can also apply oil paint with other tools. You can apply it with your fingers, you can apply it with a piece of rag, a piece of cloth, a piece of stick. But uh, brushes are the most acceptable. But the next most acceptable and most well known are the painting and palette knives, these things. Now if you look at the difference between them, especially at an edge, there is a palette knife and there is a painting knife. And you'll notice that the painting knife has an angled blade so that when you're against a canvas like that the blade touches the canvas but your fingers don't, whereas with a palette knife of course your fingers will be touching the oil paint and you get into a mess. Now you needn't really buy them both, it's probably better to have the, the painting knives for both jobs because they'll do both jobs, you can mix paint with a palette with that one, you can apply it with the, uh, with, with, with the knife as well. And different shapes of them, here's a small triangular trowel and a larger blade of painting larger areas or longer strokes edgewise on for thin lines. So those were painting and palette knives, and I would suggest you only bother buying the painting knife. The ways of applying it, um, I, my own preference is to do brushwork first with the large brushes and build up the whole canvas first in my basic tones, and then work the palette knifing over the top. It saves so much time, they look very good with the texture of the brushwork against the palette knife work, but it's your choice. As I said in the video, there are so many ways of working, so many right ways, and only a few ways that are actually wrong in the fact that they won't work. But there's no one right way of painting. These are things you must experiment and explore with and just enjoy doing and find your way. All I'm doing on this video is showing you some more new ways. 
Let's look at other tools now and the way that I use and arrange them. Here I just show you two pieces of Perspex that I use as my simple palettes. Perspex is great, it cleans easily with uh, paint cleaner afterwards. I keep an old wooden case, a leather case would do fine. And this I can carry all my oil paints, spare paints, boxes and brushes around in. So simple, so cheap. Here's a traditional wooden palette and you'll see shortly afterwards how you can clip containers onto this as well. For instance, here you see a turpentine and oil container just clipped on the side. Here you can see how I keep one palette for mixing and one palette for the paints to be stored upon. Oil paints can be frozen. You could just put cling film across these and put uh, the palette of paints into your freezer and then thaw out when you want. Like many things, buying large tubes of paint can be cheaper than buying the smaller tubes, so do think carefully about the colours you use most. It can be fun to prepare your colours even before you start the painting. Here I've mixed the colours up with a painting knife, ready to add later, and you see the variety of warm and cool greens that I can play with even before I start the painting, giving me a much better idea of my directions. Here are some examples of the different sorts of moods you can get by choosing the colour palettes earlier and being careful about warms and cools. Let's go into a little more depth on brushes. Here are my standard sets of brushes. You can see I like to use the long handled ones and in this case all of these are nylon. But you can see how I use both rounded, flat and pointed tips because they're all going to be necessary. You'll also see that uh, we can use a fan brush as well for getting various effects and blending as well. Here you see the fan brush in the centre. Very good for blending clouds. Do remember the difference between painting knives and palette knives. Here you can see them quite clearly. The painting knife has the raised handle and the palette knife is the flat bladed one straight onto the handle. My recommendation is that you stick to the painting knives only. And of course the use of different sea sponges as well and different textural sponges and any object that can give you texture on the painting that you would find useful to aid you in gaining the textures you need. It's unlikely that you'll need to use much purified linseed oil unless you're doing the glazing that we're going to show you during this program. Um, of course, uh, distilled turpentine is very nice, but ordinary turp substitute is quite adequate. Picture varnishes, I, I would always recommend the retouching varnish rather than mastic varnish because you can paint over retouching varnish and it can be lifted off later more easily without damaging the painting. Remember that you can paint your underpainting with acrylic paints, but you can't paint acrylic paints over oil paints. We'll deal with this more in depth later. Now we come to easels. My own preference for outdoor work is for a small wooden easel as you see me using here. Indoors I would use a larger studio easel. Here you see the smaller wooden easel quite adequately handling a 2030 canvas. Unless it's a very windy day you shouldn't have a problem although you can dig the easel uh, legs into the sand or soil. Here's the studio easel but it's much more cumbersome and far more difficult to carry around out of doors even with a car. Of course you can just rest things on your knee. I have something called a kneesel as well which is very useful and you can see in the composite here where I'm uh, painting in the snow that I'm using the kneesel sitting on a small stool and the canvas is resting on my knee. It's very comfortable and a very very useful machine, a very useful tool. Now let's look at all the methods and techniques that we can use to achieve our painting. Using this limited palette of black, burnt sienna, yellow ochre, raw umber and burnt umber one can get all of the effects of cools and warms just with a very sim simple limited basic few colours. As you see here the black becomes a blue and the yellow becomes almost like a lemon yellow and we can make uh, some very subtle tones and shades with this. It's well worth experimenting with. Here's a painting of uh, a lady done with the same colours. Again another very simple limited palette worth playing with just three colours of Indian red, Prussian blue and yellow ochre. These three primary colours will of course give you all of your four of red, yellow, blue and green. Of course you just mix the uh, blue and the yellow to give you the green. So it's worth you trying and experimenting with the simple palette before using a lot of colours perhaps. Many of the techniques used in oil painting can be used in acrylics. It's just that with acrylics they can be used much more quickly because the paint dries much more quickly. Here we get an idea of scale. If you had just the fish then the tank would seem very small and the fish very small, but with the figure it makes the fish look very large. In this case, uh, warm and cool colours use one against the other to give a feeling of vibrant summer day. Complementary colours or the opposites in the colour circle are also very important. You need to look more closely at my video about colour and drawing to understand this in more depth. 
Here we talk about colour in mood and atmosphere and how to get the feeling of a, a summer's day or an evening or a morning, a particular time of day. The use of movement by brushstrokes to get the feeling of movement in a painting. The brushstrokes can give you that feeling of life. We're going to look in more depth at unusual viewpoints and composition in our paintings. Again, it's covered in the video on drawing, but we will deal with all of these things here, as we will with light, the different ways of using light in our paintings from one side or behind or reflected. Also, the use of the ways of painting, body colour, the use of white in our paint and observant surfaces, and different surfaces to paint on, not just canvas, but wood or board, even metal, as long as it's primed properly. We'll look at tonal values, that a bright colour isn't necessarily a brighter tone or a lighter tone. Yellow, for instance, can be darker than even the blue. The difference in daylight and artificial light, how artificial light is more yellow and daylight more blue. Also, we'll look at uh, impasto and textures, how to make uh, the paint much thicker and build up lovely textures with your brush or with a palette knife, or even build textures up underneath the painting before you start the painting. It should be possible for the viewer to actually feel the time of day that we're painting, to feel the warmth and heat. Uh, we'll look at colour intensity and broken colour, the impressionist techniques of how by placing one colour next to another we can make a great vibrancy in the painting, we can make it shimmer again and, and feel like the time of day. Most of my paintings are painted very quickly, very freshly, one colour into another. We call it fat onto lean, for instance, where we have a lean painting underneath of, of wet paint and paint softer, fatter paint onto the top. And we will look at how to use photographs, abstract from them, and make complete new composites and new compositions from them. I will show you different ways of using the brush, different ways of uh, layering the paint on, different effects. Here we use scumbling, which is using the brush fairly dryly over the surface of the canvas to give effects. Here again we talk about the fat on lean, the thicker paint painted over thinner paint underneath. The way that the brush tip is used in making patterns or surfaces also will give us the textures, the different textures for clouds or for corn in this case, or for the landscape in the distance. I will show you different techniques for painting water, for painting reflections, for painting trees, for painting snow. We're going to look at a whole variety of different ways of using oil paints. There are so many exciting ways to apply oil paints. We can use our fingers, we can use a cloth, we can use brushes, but of course we can use the painting knife. And here are several examples of my using a painting knife. Sometimes over brushwork, sometimes over acrylic, and sometimes just directly one on top of another, fat on lean. I shall do a full demonstration for you in this film. It's very important to use and understand the two perspectives, both aerial and linear. Here we have both, the aerial being the use of colour from warm to cool doing to the background, and the linear, the use of line to draw our eye back in. And of course, as I've already mentioned, we will use photographs to make composites and assist us with our painting as well for studies. Here are some step-by-steps. You may wish to put your video onto pause, or the DVD onto pause, so you can look at these a little longer. This one is an acrylic over a dark ground, built up in glazes, but it could equally have been done in oils. And here another step-by-step -step in oils of azaleas done in savannah. You will see how I work from the background and gradually, having built up a misty eff effect of light, put on my light and darks and build them up one over another, getting into more detail as I go along. We start very loosely and we finish as tight as we wish. Working in this way, the painting is very simple. It's like a jigsaw. You put the right colours in the right shapes in the right places and the painting will just appear before your eyes. Even if something is very complicated, this is a very easy way to paint it. Do note how I work from the cool colours in the background to the warm colours in the foreground. Glazes with oil paints must dry between coats, but it is possible, but requires patience. In this case, I've painted uh, several bands of grey across and this was a technique used in uh, some of the earlier Venetian painting where they would paint the whole painting, underpaint the whole painting in a, a variety of greys, just tonally and then they would work the colour of the glazes over the top. With acrylics of course you're just using water with the plastic paint. With oils they used uh, refined linseed oil and they would only use uh, three colours. They'd use yellow, blue and red in that order. If we put the yellow on first and then we glaze blue over the yellow when it's dry um, it will make the green and then if we use the red over the top of that wherever we need it it'll make the brown or the reds. So we just have to, uh, if, if we put yellow and just red it'll make the orange and so on. 
So we'll, we'll make a series of bands of colour across here to show you how that works. Um, the linseed oil makes it transparent. So uh, a medium that is actually fairly opaque, and opaque means you can't see through it, can be made transparent by using it with uh, linseed oil. And also, of course, certain pigments are more transparent than others. So let's put a very thin coat of yellow across here, just to get the idea of how a glaze will work. So a little distilled turpentine and linseed oil. And it is important when doing a glaze that we use very high quality materials. It doesn't matter so much with an impasto or thicker paint. And you can see that the uh, tones show through underneath. So we'll put this glaze right the way across, just to give you an idea. The glaze, the same with, with watercolour as well, is a transparent wash. It's a thin layer of paint which allows the underneath coat to show through. So. And there you can see the greys at the top and now it becomes graduations of creams or a yellow. When that dries we'll put on some of the red to give the orange and then we'll uh, use some of the uh, blue to make uh, the greens and the browns and other colours that we can do with the glaze. I'll make it a little bit heavier. The more pigment we use then the thicker the glaze will be. Okay we're ready for our second glaze so I'm going to put some red now over this and you see that it goes to an orange we can still see the tones through if we put it over where the white is at the top, then we have a pink and we have a more orange colour here. And the thicker we build it, the more heavily you build it, the more red it would become. We'll come down to this level here so that I can paint the blue over in a minute and then you can see the effect of the blue, which will make a green here on the yellow and a more browny colour where the uh, red is. So this is glazing in three tones, painting in layers over dead colour, in other words over just black and white. Of course you could glaze over other colours and you can use it in any permutation you like. But it takes a long time to do because oil paint and the uh, linseed oil in it takes a long time to dry. With acrylics it's much faster of course, you can glaze like this very very quickly. If we come back onto our glazing now and we bring the blue in here, let's see if we can turn this yellow to a, a green. There we go. Come all the way down so that we can see the blue at the bottom over the white. If we come over the red, we start to get a yellow blue, a more browny colour, and you can see how we now have the effect of all different glazes giving us a variety of colours. And you can build up your colours by mixing glazes one over the other over a tonal ground as well as one colour over another in glazes. Body colour is the addition of white to a colour. So if I use this yellow we were just using here, and you can see it's fairly transparent. And if I was using it over a white canvas it would be giving me a cream. But it's very jelly-like and transparent. If I were to mix some white with it, then it would give it body and it would be less transparent and much heavier. So even the addition of a little bit of white will give us a much thicker, more opaque colour. This is body colour. Then we have something called a frotty, which is you, a glaze which uses white. So in this case it's going to be thinned down and you can see the dark colour is just showing through underneath and it makes it semi-opaque. It's called a frotty. Then the scraping back. This is where we can use a brush of paint first of all if we want to 
In this case we'll make a little orange. Which will show up against the, the, the dark underpainting just to give you an idea. And that might be painted on fairly, fairly heavily. I'm putting on not an impasto but a reasonably thick layer of paint. Creamy paint, not thin down, just straight on. And then if we take our painting knife, we can scrape it back. Now if there was a colour underneath, then we see the colour underneath. In this case it's the, the black. And this is called scraping back. So if I had painted colours underneath and then I put more colour over the top and I wanted that texture to show through, I can take my painting knife and remove, even in lines or drawing you see, and remove areas to give textures to scrape back. For instance, I could have a deep green for a grass, put a lighter green on top and start scraping back to let the deep green show through. Now we have something called pulling, which is where we pull the surface colour back to the under colour, not just scraping it, but actually pulling it. So we'll just make a little opaque, creamy orange here and put it on. And then either with a sponge or with a cloth, you can pull this colour back to the under colour. Especially if the undercolour is slightly damp as well, it will blend it. So we take some cloth and we can dab and pull it back so the undercolour starts to show through. Pull this tack, tack, tack on here and then you start to see the undercolour coming through. And the more you do it, the more the undercolour will come through. Next we come to impasto, a favourite for many of us with oil paint because it really is what oil paint is about, I think. If I want to use thinner colours, I can use gouache, I can use watercolour, I can use acrylic. But if I want to use really heavy, bold colours, then it's really nice to have something much stronger, which you can do impasto with. Pasto paint is layered on, it's lathered on, lots of it, look. You can see how thick and heavy that is. We take our paint and you can really see the surfaces building up there of heavy impasto paint. A la primer, direct, straight onto the canvas. Which then brings us next into uh, wet into wet. If I continue this up and the paint is still wet. As long as I paint delicately, the paint will not be lifted from underneath. If I paint harder, it will. So for instance, if I take uh, some orange now, and I paint delicately on top, the paint underneath does not come through. Just a little perhaps, that's wet into wet. If I push it a little harder, then of course the colour underneath blends. So if I paint very delicately, with a delicate touch, it goes on without the paint underneath showing through. If I don't, then it'll come through from underneath. That's wet into wet. Wet under dry, of course. This is a dry area here. Wet over dry is where the paint is dry and we're painting on top of the dry, so therefore nothing lifts from underneath at all. It's absolutely clear and plain. Two very different effects. And they are variations of a la prima, in other words direct painting. And of course we can add materials to these paints. I mean, while this is still wet, we could uh, drop sand or push materials into it, sawdust, anything we like. We can mix stuff with the paint itself to paint on. We can put gravel or sand or seeds or things into the paint um, to add on to give it more texture. We can actually build up the surface of the canvas as I'm going to show you later 
um, with uh, mixing a, a filler with PVA glue and a primer and adding that to give texture underneath in the same directions as our brush marks might actually be to really build it up and look like we've put tons and tons of impasto paint on. Which we haven't done yet and that we can do with our fingers. So you can take the oil paint and you can actually blend and rub with your fingers in exactly the same way as you can with a brush. You can paint with your fingers as well. Why not? It's good fun. And about taking us back to being children, but you can get some wonderful smooth effects. And one of the demonstrations I'm going to do today will show you just that. So we can rub with our fingers. Um, we can blend. That's merging one colour into another. With our fingers or with a brush. This is called blending. So we can use a brush or we can use our fingers and you can blend these colours together gently. Then there's teasing where you can work into the paint to give more texture. So we can come in here with a brush and just tease it out to give a little texture. The stiffer the brush, the bigger the bristles, the more texture you're going to get depending upon how thick the paint is. That's called teasing. Splattering is another one, which we do more with watercolour than with, um, with this sort of paint. But splattering, if we take our brush, and we want a fairly bristly brush for this, um, then we should be able to splatter like this look. You can get all these various effects with it. So here we're getting hairy ones, but you can get the, 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 the uh, more liquid the paint, the more splattery it'll become. So that's splattering. We tend to use that more with watercolour than with oil paints, but and if you took a big brush you could really hit it hard, you could do all sorts of things. And of course there's texturing with sponges, that's great to do as well. Or even with a rag, um, you know, just to use a rag to make texture can be very very effective. I mean, let's, for instance, take this bit of rag I've got here and bundle it up just a little and we'll take the texture we've got there and look at the texture you can make with a rag, which could give you bushy effects. And then we also have something called cross-hatching, which is usually done with um, a pointed brush you can do it with a flat brush. Let's take our flat brush for instance and just show you just that because we can use a flat brush to use the edge of it. Cross hatching is when you do a series of lines and you cross them. So you can do this with a round brush or a flat if it comes to it. And of course we can have texture by using the end of a brush and depending on the brush the type of textures you're going to get. In this case, using the brush at different angles or even different directions will give, give us different textures for the end of a tree or a branch or whatever. Feathering is when we use the brush in short strokes to paint. Feather, 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 like that. If we do it across at a different angle, it becomes cross hatching again, but cross hatching by feathering. Or we can use the very short strokes of the Impressionist, like this style painting. That brief demonstration gives us our basic techniques, our basic methods of using oil paint. Um, obviously, we can paint in pasta with a brush or with a palette knife, it doesn't matter which. But all of those different techniques can be used together or individually to produce the type of painting we want and experiment and explore by using different things to make textures with um, or do different effects for the uh, type of uh, object you're painting. Now let's get on with uh, actually doing some painting, shall we, and seeing how we can use those uh, techniques in, in, in the real work. Here's a very complicated composition of Beverly Minster, a 2430 oil painting, where I'm using the technique of blocking in colours, of actually drawing out on a white canvas and then gradually painting my colours in one by one and blocking and gradually blending, then working paint over those colours, usually the mid-tones and lighter colours first and then working up to my very darks and finally the brightest colours at the very end. 
It would also have been possible to do this with acrylics first of all and work all the underpainting up and then finally finish with heavier impasto paint oil painting over the top. Why not use several photographs to make your composition? Here you can see I've used five photographs to make up an oil painting of a beach scene. And here's the final work. All of those photographs have been used to make this rather fun composition giving the feeling of the heat of a, a late afternoon. Again another beach scene and I'm working onto a white canvas. It's very important when painting figures or animals that you try to paint them in the same style and method and looseness as the rest of the painting. So here I've painted all the background first or most of it then I start to work in the figures in exactly the same loose technique to keep the feeling of movement. There's nothing worse than a very stiffly painted cardboard cutout figure on the landscape afterwards. I am going to demonstrate this for you later. This particular painting I'm only going to need a few brushes. I've got a rigger here, a round rigger, and three different size flats from an eighth up to a quarter up to a half inch. It's only a small painting so I don't think I'll need larger brushes for this one. I've already drawn out the, the composition lightly in um, pencil. Now the painting I'm going to use, the picture I'm going to use. I'm going to work from one of my enhanced photographs, a digital one from the uh, computer again. Plenty of colour on it. And I'll start with the sky. I'm going to use a lot of broken colour, but I'm going to start with just painting in basic layers of colour. I want to enhance my colours, I want to push the colours. So I'm going to use Cerulean to start with and some white which we will call body colour. White in an opaque paint becomes body colour. It builds up the colours quite quickly. It makes them quite thick and quite heavy. It always looks very dark on a white canvas when you first start. So I'm using the larger of the, of the few brushes I've got. But once you get the canvas covered of course the paint will appear lighter. It's always difficult when you first start off a painting. Just get this canvas covered is the main thing at the moment. Get some colour onto the canvas. It's better to add the colour to white than it has than it is to try and put white into a colour. Generally, if you try and put white into a colour, you'll end up with gallons of it. If you add, if you start off with the white, it only takes the tiniest touch of a colour. I'm going to come back to the cerulean blue now. Slightly greener tint, especially around here. Now, as I say, it seems fairly strong at the moment, but it will look a lot lighter when I get the other colours in. Now, this of course means that if I go a bit darker and stronger in colour now, later on when I do lighter colours, they're really going to shine out and sing. And look how lovely that green looks against the cerulean, and it makes the cerulean look even cooler. Very rapid way of working. I want to show you this technique so you can work like this out of doors yourself. Right, that's it. That's got the canvas covered in the sky. Now I've done that, I'm going to work these little short strokes one into another to blend those colours together there. And this will give us the broken colour effect that the impressionist got. An effect of light, of shimmering haze in the background. Same green and find this, these hills in the background, these mountains. But I'm also going to place some warmer blue in a moment and some warmer pinks. Now that comes right up and through and down to sort of quite heavy cliffs down here. In the distance then we've got this lovely blue-green going on. So a little bit of cobalt around this top edge. And then back to my warm again the pink and add a little bit of that rose pink to the cobalt. It should give me a nice delicate move to give the distant effect of this cliff merging into the Mediterranean haze. This photograph is taken in Provence, so a nice place to use for that. I can play my blues against that purple. I really want to separate these colours out. With photographs, photographs flatten things. You need to, to pull things out. You need to find these colours and pull them apart more. Just use broken colour there, that's it. We're getting that. That purple pink comes through into the wave a bit here. 
down here. And look how lovely that looks. See how dark that now appears to be and misty into the background. I just wish to get this canvas covered as quickly as I can. I really do need to get rid of all this nasty white stuff here. <laughs> I could have put a coloured ground on, which is very you know useful for an impressionist painting because you can let the colour show through. Constable did it with his, although he wasn't an impressionist, he was, he was um, pre. Um, he did it with a, a, a burnt umber ground and let that deep brown glow through. Uh, when he was painting trees, for instance, he wouldn't even paint the branches, he'd paint the light areas like negative shapes around the branches, leaving the branches behind. You can't get the movement of water without having brush strokes that also move. We have to really um, become lively in the use of our, our brush strokes and paint if we're going to have a lively moving subject. Have some of the ultramarine. Perhaps a tad darker down here, that's better. A bit, a bit stronger because it's going to be a blue that I need to need to do some of the shadows with. It's a lovely warm blue, it's such a beautiful sky blue in a way. And how by using the jigsaw method of placing one colour next to another in the right places we can just make a painting appear out of nowhere. Oh look at that, isn't that gorgeous? Just look at the difference that um, ultramarine makes look coming into the shadows here and I'm going to go even darker with that ultramarine yet but doesn't that really give that that different shadow a little more of it I think don't overdo it but a little stronger down there I think in places there we go look let's really make these colors sing and of course she's got the scene coming through here and over her body here and little splashes of this ultramarine and we can start doing the figures now because she's got ultramarine coming down the side here and I'm going to treat the figure as loosely as I've treated the rest you don't start treating parts of the painting differently like this. It's, it's all one painting, it's all one effect of light and we want to keep that liveliness going. Oh she's got a beautiful piece of ultramarine just around the corner there, just on the back side here. Let's have a look, there we are. A little bit lighter later, later lighter, but that'll do for the moment, that's better. Just coming around into there. Anywhere else in the figure? Yes, there's a little bit here along the leg, coming out there. Where it is, you've got to place it. The right colours, in the right shapes, in the right places, and the painting will just appear. It works, I'm showing it to you. You know, don't argue with me. Come on, trust Uncle Peter. Here we are. It's happening on the canvas before your very eyes. A little bit of that blue back up into here, a little bit more warmth there, just to bring these cool shapes out in the... Because if we put, we put rough next to smooth, warm next to cool, light next to dark, this is our armoury, this is what helps us to make one colour one color stand out more than another. It's, it's, you know, it's one colour having an effect upon another. White now into my bit of body colour, bit of white, I told you what body colour is. Uh, it's using the white in the paint to make it more opaque and more um, consistent, heavier, thicker. Here we are with the yellow ochre coming down amongst all this sparkling surf that's just coming around. They're just enjoying themselves so much, these girls, and I'm going to enjoy myself so much with these bits of paint too. Can't let all enjoy ourselves. They're giving me all this pleasure in letting me photograph them there, playing and painting. They're the daughters of a French lass I went to stay with in Provence. So before I put some purple amongst this brown, which I will do, now well, we've got that colour, let's put it in here into her leg because you see when we've got the colour going we'll use it, wherever it is we'll use it. We may adjust it later but at the moment that's what I need there. Just soften it a bit, not too dark that warm. Come down the shadowed side of her arm there right colours and the right shapes and the right places. Let's just indicate a thumb, why not? And we'll just indicate, we're giving an impression remember, I've got to paint exactly all of these things are there. I'll put 
put in the whole of her dark side of her face here and I'm cut into that in a moment with the lighter colours down around her neck here so it's all coming together quite loosely look actually her back must come over here so more it comes through here and then it actually comes over and down there and I painted over that bit that's better it's got her back in again I need to put that in with a lighter colour later keep it a brown I might be darker than that yet later but I just want to establish this for the minute I need to cut into that. I've made that a bit too crude at the moment, but um, come back there in a moment. Let's have a look at her hair now. Same with this young lady. There's a bit of warm coming down the side of her hair there. We'll put some cool in there in a moment. And over her shoulder strap here, I've got a feeling, yeah. And now a bit more cool into it, so it becomes the cooler side of the dark. Got a slight pattern going on around her costume, so we'll just flip that in. Now, come on, don't tell me you can't see this figure appearing there now. We've got to play light against dark, cool against warm, rough against smooth. A little bit dark coming around there, a little bit of a flip, there we go. And a small indication of a darker bit or two coming down around there. Now, back to this young lady again. We wanted it a bit darker just under her tummy here, that little bit there, look. And a wee bit more there. Now her hair comes down across her forehead here, down there, and flicks out into the. There we go. A big bit more blue back in there in a moment, but not yet. That's just. Establish things. And down uh, this bit of the leg. Cut in there again later. When I say cut in, it means that if I go over an edge and it's not quite detailed enough, I know I can come back later with the paint that's in that area and cut back around that edge to tidy it up. If I make the brush into a blade, in other words, I've squeezed the paint out a bit, I should be able to come down the edge of the leg here, just feel my way down. You see, with quite a, a, a sizable brush, you can still paint, you can do this with watercolour the same, you can make the squeeze the brush out into a blade and therefore be able to paint a line. I'll come back with a bit of dark in there in a moment, just go around but with, with a finer brush still. just want to get some of these highlights in. Um, yes, there's a nice bit of light just coming in around her here, below her chin. shoulder catches the light and you can see I'm picking her out now and also if we're careful we should just I'm going to rest my fingertip on there just the tip of her nose now I want to bring it out to catch a bit of sunlight there now you don't just have to use the brush itself I can use the brush handle here to actually mold this paint and soften it back a little Dark down that side of the arm. Let's just look at these dark areas. Let's look at that thumb for a moment. Where that finger comes out. There's another one. And another one. And there we have a hand. As simple as that. We want an impression of the hand, that's all. What about the other hand here? That's a bit darker on that edge. Just where the thumb goes around holding her hand here. And this one comes out a bit there. Comes around. The smallest indication there. 
perhaps a little darker under this arm because it's far shorter than that arm anyway. The reflected light going on that we can now see. So need to cut in around that wrist a little bit more, I think, there because that's a little bit pleb just there. This figure's getting a little bit worn now, but we should be able to make that into quite a nice little point. Because I've got to start tickling in and playing with these loose strands of hair that are floating around here in the wet wind. Wet wind? Hmm, that's quite good, doesn't it? Coming out of there. And round of here and down. Look at that. You see just a few strokes and we're there. And how these darker colours now totally affect what's going on around them. Including the bathing costume where it's needed. Just little bits of dark here and there where it's required. Now she's got a slight smile to her, hasn't she? Let's see what we can do about that bit of eye, too. And a little bit of dark on the smile, just to... Don't want it too much, Peter. There we go, that'll do. Let's look at the swimming costume on this one, because she has a bit of dark. Under a little tummy, little young thing. There we go. Just a few flicks to show where the swimming costume goes. I'm going to start with a very light cream, just to see if I can give a bit of sparkle to the water here and there. See what it does. So this is just lemon yellow and white, giving a sparkle to where they're splish splashing about. Oh yes, we've got some of that going on back up here amongst the pinks too. A bit more white, just to keep it really light, but still a tint. It's not pure white, it's still a tint of cream going on in here along the top of that surf there.
Here again, small brush strokes, but masses of them to build up the leaves and the plants and the flowers, and the two girls being more plainly painted, more solidly painted. If you've actually seen Monet's If you've actually seen Monet's paintings in reality, in the flesh, you might think that he built up inches and inches of paint, but in fact, when I looked at them more closely, I found he'd done something similar to this. He's mixed up a heavy material to paint impasto underneath the surface painting. He's built up the body underneath onto the canvas, and then primed it with a colour, and let that colour show through the final painting on the surface. In my case, I've used a filler, and PVA glue and then primed with whatever colours I wish. He used yellow ochre, I've used several different uh, colours and then put my painting, scumbled my painting over the surface leaving the underpainting glowing through as you can see on the demonstrations here. It also gives us a chance to use mixed media. Here the sky has gold leafing in it. When the texture is combined with vibrant colours and the underpainting glows through, it can be extremely effective as you can see here with this painting of delphiniums. The texture underneath can be built up with brushes or a palette knife and because it's very plastic with the use of PVA and filler, it can be painted onto any good primed surface, canvas or board or wood. Ordinary cheap filler but it's interior filler so it's nice and fine. We don't want the exterior sort. Um, which is very gravelly. We could use that, but it would wear the brushes down very quickly. And I'm going to mix that up first with some water and then add my PVA glue afterwards. I don't want it too thick, otherwise I shan't be able to get it on there at all and too thin it will just splurge everywhere so carefully just enough to make a nice heavy cream I can always add a bit more filler if I need to right now a bit of PVA glue polyvinyl acetate basically a liquid plastic. Very useful stuff. Um, it dries transparent and if you use it over tissue paper, over tissue paper you can get some wonderful effects because the tissue becomes transparent and you can put layers and layers over one another using this white glue. Same stuff that you use for woodworking, the white PVA glue. Okay, I don't want too heavy a texture on this one so I've got just a nice creamy mixture there. these nice big bits of grass here and uh, iris leaves coming up so I'm going to decided it would be nice to do an experiment with a series of different shapes and mixed medium on surfaces. In this case um, it follows on from doing some gold leaf work with the medieval castle some years ago where I did a three-piece triptych. Um, I liked working over the gold leafing with oil paint and working around it. So it's rather nice to build your frame first and then paint within it rather than do a painting and then frame it afterwards. Here I've made up some interesting shapes uh, in this case a diamond rather than just a square to paint on and I'll show you some other examples of even more interesting shapes in a moment. The outer frame has been covered with metallic foiling and the inner with gold leafing. Uh, the inner, the, the centre part of the whole panel uh, is raised and then painted with oil paints afterwards and of course you can adjust your colours then to suit the framing as well.
Continuing with this mixed media work, one of my pots here where I've melted glass into the bottom of it in the kiln. And I love this idea of one material and texture against another. So I've taken this onto this next panel over here and into the bottom corners um, by melting glass into small ceramic trays that I've made to go against the colours of the oil painting itself. And again on this painting we've got the gold leafing in the background and then the metallic foils, um, raised shapes again and sunk panels, but the actual panel here is in four quarters, almost coming up like a pyramid, and then linking the flowers through and coming off onto the gold leaf panels, so we've got the aisles directly over and against the gold leafing as well. Working with a black background for an oil painting or a dark background is quite nice, as it is working with any coloured background to work across. It means I can work up and establish my mediums and lights fairly quickly. And here we are just sort of getting the, the portrait virtually um, built and then working loosely around it with this oil painting. Now with this technique I'm working fat over lean, so in other words I've put leaner, thinner paint underneath and I'm now working up the uh, colours on top, using slightly thicker, more opaque, heavier paint, just in short strokes, keeping it nice and clean and pure. Those are the things I want, I can blend them in a bit. This board is quite nice because like most hard boards, if they're primed with an acrylic primer or with uh, an emulsion, they're still slightly absorbent, which means that you can uh, put the paint on and it's soaking some of the oil in and drying it out a little bit more quickly than it would on a smoother canvas, which enables you to put cleaner colour over the top more easily. So why just be stuck with the uh, limitations of working on a square or rectangular canvas? You can work on a, a round board or an elliptical board. You can make frames of any shape and size. They can be flat, they can come outwards. As long as it's primed correctly and stable, you can have great fun. In these cases I've made the frames first and then painted afterwards, which has enabled me to blend in with the colours of the framing and the design. But the possibilities are endless. You could make furniture, you could add the paintings to the furniture, you could paint within the furniture, you could build the furniture or the wall or the house around your paintings. Let your imagination be free. Here are three more step-by-steps showing how we can work over a dark acrylic ground. In this case it's on board and I've painted the oils over the top of the acrylic. But in the next instance we go back to the step-by-step -step of an acrylic painting of goldfish in a pond where I've painted glazes of acrylic paint over a dark acrylic ground in the same way that you could with oils. Here we have the gold leafing and the oil paints painted into a dark ground in the background. Beautiful way to work with gold leafing and metallic foiling around the outside. But the use of broken colour gradually building up in small strokes of paint from the mid-tones to the dark tones and light tones at the end. So working up the mid-tones first and then finishing with the darks and lightest at the end which we can do with oil paints. 
These next three panels were actually done by building up the texture with a brush, not with a painting or palette knife, and then putting the grounds, different coloured grounds, over each panel for the different effects I wanted. A light yellow ochre, a duck egg green and a pale blue, each being used for different times of the day, midday, morning and evening. The main colours were then scumbled and worked up over the surface of the texture. Here's a straightforward flat canvas, but this time again using a lot of broken colour and playing one colour against another in the colour circle, the warms against the cools and the opposite of the colour circle. And this one, a midnight scene, again the texturing done again with deep purple shining through the blues, then those yellows shining out against the purples for the light at night. See Mono here again, the master at work, and this beauty of the oranges and yellows against the purples and the reds, playing cools against warm. You see the warm cools there, the blues, almost purpley blues, played against the cooler greeny blues. Here again we see the blues, the cools and the warms of the sunset, and the effects of light, just brush strokes softly blending into the background rather than lots of detail. This haziness of these effects of light, look at the way that that sun shines pink against those purpley blues in the foreground. The oranges come through. This is one of mine done in New Zealand with the computer enhancement. And uh, again, I'm play, playing with a lot of broken colour here, as you can see. That uh, one colour vibrating through another. It's quite a big canvas. I'm going to demonstrate how I will paint uh, an Impressionist painting of a poppy field like this. It's going to be a composite, in other words I'm going to use several of the photographs, I'll show you them here, and I'm going to put these photographs together, again with a separate photograph of the girl that was taken in Toulouse, taken through a, a cafe window in fact, so you never know when you're going to see a shot you want, so you just caught against the light, thought I can use that sometime. So I placed her into the photograph, uh, into the painting on the left here, it's going to be an Impressionist technique of broken colour. Now broken colour is where we put little bits of colour one to another and instead of say mixing red and yellow together to make orange we'll put little bits of red and yellow paint together which will give fool the eye into giving the effect of a very bright orange. It's much more vibrant that way. So you'll see me handling the sky in this way and all the rest of the painting. Although I might block in areas at first and blend them um, I will eventually feather and just tickle in little bits of colour on top. We're going to start the painting by doing the drawing and then by layering thin layers of paint at the bottom which will work into afterwards with impasto, so wet into wet. Thin layers scumbled and feathered and then more paint on top, wet into wet and delicately placing, placing impasto or thicker paint on top of that at the end. We're working in three planes, warm, cooler, cooler. And you see here that the greens in the foreground are warmer than the greens in the back, especially here, where we've got very, very blue greens. Now, any colour can be warm or cool. A green can be warm by being more brown, or it can be more blue by being more turquoise. So can a red. The reds we're going to use here um, vary from the cadmium red, which are very warm, very bright, through to the alizarins and the roses and right down to purples which are more cooler because a purple is a more bluey red than uh, say the cadmium red which are much warmer and the oranges. And if we play one colour against another obviously that's going to help as well. For instance the reds against the greens are very bright because they are the opposites in the colour circle. Red next to green in the colour circle is the opposite as purple is to yellow. So again we're using those two effects here to give more vibrance, more sunlight and in our armoury we have rough next to smooth, light next to dark and cool next to warm. And then if we use the colour circles as well, we can get a very, very vibrant painting with this Impressionist technique. OK, so I'll demonstrate now piece by piece how we do this. I'm going to use only three brushes, a large flat one inch um, nylon bristle and an ordinary half inch nylon with a round end but flat and a pointed round brush and an ordinary painting knife to do a little bit of textural work. Even with the flats, of course, we can use them blade on, sideways on, for thinner areas as well. And you'll see how I scumble and use various feathering techniques to produce this painting.
start here with the, uh, the sky and do a graduated sky <coughs> working with uh, blending a background, a series of layers up here from cerulean blue into a slight uh, cobalt and then into an ultramarine and blend them together and then with an impressionist technique gradually go back into those um, with uh, other colours to brighten it to give a broken colour effect uh, broken colour being one colour against another so we'll come down to our white this oil paint on here is already dry so it's not going to mix in with uh, from previous days it's not going to mix in with today's colour and um, uh, I'm going to use uh, a little bit at first of Sara Lee and Blue with the white just a tad there, it's almost too strong and again <clears throat> I want to be a, a little bit warm on the horizon so I'm going to take a little bit of um, violet and here we go back up onto the canvas and well, just here's my line of the horizon of the uh, trees. So now we're making a slightly stronger blue green. And we'll add that on the next line up. It seems quite a big jump, but actually, when it's blended, it won't be. What I'm going to do now is feather, perhaps use little strokes like this, feather the colours together gently with the edge of the brush, the very tip of the brush. Just blending together and we go to the final edge of the canvas with the warmer blue again which will make the cooler blue seem cooler in other words if we put light next to dark if we put cool next to warm if we put rough next to smooth all of these things are opposites so I just got to tickle it on the surface and it, it just blends in a fraction but not so much that we lose the colour and then as I come down here, I can bring, I can drag the tip of the brush, the same colour and the one above, into the sky below. And then as I come down here, I can bring, I can drag the tip of the brush, the same colour and the one above, into the sky below. So that the layers join together and give a shimmering effect of light. Because I want this shimmering effect of a summer's day there we go i think that's quite effective yes. enough the sunset where it's warm in the background and cool in the foreground nearly always it goes warm cooler cooler so we have a browner green a cooler green a bluer green a bluer green here now the trees may look very warm but we know they're further back we want to push them back so i want to make them a little cooler so i'm going to make quite a cool green at first. It wants to be fairly dark. Let's try mid green first of all. That was that was the cerulean and a little bit of lemon. Um, up here to the horizon where the trees are against the sky. And this is pure cerulean with a little bit of white and a little bit of lemon yellow. Now we need to go a bit stronger so we'll take some of that again with the lemon yellow again but this time no white so some of the lemon yellow some of the cerulean no white mix it up here and now you see how much stronger that is and it gives us a lovely soft hazy effect of the trees going back into the distance we still want to keep fairly cool so I'm now going to move to the uh, ultramarine and add that to it add the ultramarine to the same colour with the yellow in it come back to here and let's look at the shadows in the trees now well, as you see I've now done the basics of the uh, trees in the background and we're going to work up into this area here where uh, there are a few darker branches mix um, quite a dark colour I'm going to take some Prussian blue which is my darkest blue. Add into that, add some uh, raw umber, which will give me a very nice dark. I don't mix black, I mix something that will make a colour that is very dark, like a black. So if I use either sienna or umber um, and Prussian blue, 
I can get a very good dark. And I can make the dark warmer or cooler simply by adding more blue or more um, brown. Those darks just help to bring out the feeling of the explosion of the leaves. Here again, we want to go from, oh it's quite a yellowy green in the background but we still know it's cooler so I'll take a little bit of the cerulean again and some of the lemon yellow into that. It's quite light in the distance so a bit more lemon yellow. And we're going to come across here. I want some more yellows in there later but I'll let the turp soak into the canvas a bit. I just want to get rid of this white canvas just getting on my nerves because I can't see what I'm doing. And the way that that links into just feather the edges. And how much stronger this green is now, warmer this green is than the background one was. Got to go quite warm with it. Yeah. Okay, a bit of, I've just put some chrome yellow into that now. Mix some chrome yellow with the um, cerulean and lemon yellow I was using to bring it warmer into the foreground. I shall go warmer than that yet too. Now let's take some of that lemon again because in the background there there's very light. I put some white with a colour, it's called a body colour. Uh, white is very opaque and uh, it makes the paint less transparent being opaque. You can see some of the recession now of the warmer greens here in the foreground, going back to the cooler ones. The feeling of these stems of poppies and lots and lots of leaves simply by doing a series of short brush strokes with the darks and lights amongst these greens I'm adding on. It looks very complicated. But once it's finished it looks very, very effective because we work up these textures one over another. And uh, it makes it look as if I spent hours and hours painting in lots and lots of poppy stems, which in fact I haven't. A dark colour again, I'm going to use some ultramarine and uh, burnt sienna, which will give me quite a nice dark. And we just pop in some stems with the round. You see how easy they are. And with the effects I've already got, I mean, for instance, here where I've got a dark, I can drag up from that dark to give the effect of it being a bunch of dark shadow. I'll just do one little area here to give you an idea. In fact, as you'll notice, we've almost totally lost. Uh, all the white areas now. I can just see sort of one or two of them as to where I want. You can see how that now is building up to look like lots and lots of tangled leaves and grass amongst the uh, poppies. Now let's move across to this left hand area over here and do a bit of palette knife work there before working back with the same technique across it. Now if we take the painting knife we should be able to mix up a bit of colour In this case some white, some yellow and a touch of the blue cobalt and we can start to add a bit more texturing of some leaves and stem effects on here which we couldn't get so easily with a, a brush, a different sort of texture in other words. like grassy little effects. 
tip there, to get a point of the leaf. Use it up if you want. A bit of more lemon yellow coming in here. And we can just scumble it in on the top with a knife. Even the texture of the canvas at that distance is uh, useful because it gives the effect of little yellow flowers there. So a mixture of techniques. Use a little bit of deep purple into that brown I had earlier and work into her hair here. Just got like a halo around her head. So we'll take the deep purple and a little blue and a touch of brown just to warm it a bit. And just literally lock in the shapes for the minute. Now she comes down into her shoulders, but there's still a halo silhouette around the shoulders. Warm up the edge of this arm a fraction. that same colour around the back of her neck here and link it in, in a moment with that dark colour by blending look. Yes, that's quite a nice colour for that. And the light, strangely, seems to become a bit cooler around the left-hand side. So I'm going to uh, make up some more of that cerulean and come in with the cerulean over this side. There we are. Let's see what happens with that. We have the warm against the cool, the light against the dark, the warm against the cool, the rough against the smooth. Let's bring that. I haven't finished yet because I want to bring some more cream into it, but just to give you an idea of how we can play off warm and cool, even in reflected light like this. Bring it round the body. Those quite nice little folds she's got in the creases there. Do this colour here we used earlier and make a grey out of it by just mixing it with a little of the white. There we go. And you see how that lovely warm yellow ochre gives the effect of the sunlight there. Coming down the front of her head, out here. It's a little more white in a moment there. Let's go around the back of her head first. Here. Certainly down around here, but I want a bit more pink in there later. And you see the effect we get of her against the sunshine now. So I haven't finished her yet, but it's just to give you an idea of how simple the figure can be. Um, 
painted in this way. Well it's the flowers that we're now going to work on. Here are a couple of the daisies I've painted. I'm just showing you some of the colours that we shall use in the poppies. I'm in fact using several reds. I'm using cadmium orange, cadmium red, uh, rose and a little bit of alizarin as well. So I'm back to using my two main brushes again. Uh, I've got the, the three brushes with me, the one inch and this little half inch slightly rounded end uh, nylon for acrylic and oils and my little round pointy brush which would be nice for the petals here of the um, daisies. Although I could paint it equally with this flat brush because of course you can use the blade of the brush as well as the flat side. I'm going to start off with um, just a basic cadmium red. It's a nice simple colour to use. So here are our reds, but the alizarin crimson, the rose, the cadmium red, the cadmium orange. And then we've got the, um, the purples here, the violet and the purple again, which would be very useful for the cools under the shadows of the poppies. Let's just take the cadmium red first of all. Put a bit of pure colour on, just, just tickle it on like that, just tickle it on. Just, just tickle the, the paint, don't um, push it too hard. Okay, well you see I've now got all the basic reds in. I've got my uh, cadmium red used all over the canvas and now I'm going to go to the cadmium orange and mix a little bit of white with it for the background for the furthest uh, sunlight on the poppies and use pure cadmium orange in the foreground just to pick up the sunlight catching the tops of the petals. Using the paint a lot more thickly now you'll notice that I'm actually uh, layering and lathering it almost on here on the edges of the petals to build up. So we will put in the sun, catching it directly. Look at that, how that shines out now. And the sunlight streams across. I right, will take a little white and mix it here. Nothing is ever pure white, nothing is ever pure black, because where there is light, there must be colour, whether it be yellow sunlight, yellow artificial light, a pink sunset, or blue light from the sky. So when I have white I nearly always try and tint it with something unless I'm really stuck at the very end and can't go any further because colour is light and makes things vibrant. And the same as I don't use black to make a black because it's dead. Um, I tend to use um, you know a mixture of deep blues, deep black browns to make a warm or a cool dark. So here I'm going to uh, make the petals a little at a touch of red at the moment and then some cream later. Da, 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 da. And the petals actually come around towards us so we don't see. And to finish that one off, if I just go to my um, chrome or cadmium yellow, doesn't matter which, and then put a little bit of yellow in the middle, we have instant data. So this is where we use what we've done in the background. Uh, earlier on with our scumbling to make it look as if we've done a lot of work and now just with a few strokes carefully placed we should be able to make it look as if we spent hours and hours. Yes, when we get the pure lesbian in just look at the, the difference it makes here to these much darker and it links over with the um, figure over there as well Building up again, and now we're using this rose with a little bit of white to just catch the highlights of the um, edge of the petals with a bit of pink. I'll have to just stand back and take a look at that, but I think we must be almost there. I think I just need to make a bit more um, of a link between this dark area and this light area. There seems to be too big a jump, it is almost like two halves. Well I shall look at it again later and I may do a few more little additions but I don't think I'll do much to that now. I think we're, we're almost there. And remember please that a signature is an integral part of the painting, it's a very important part of the painting and uh, it can ruin a painting if you don't get it right. So you know have a nice neat signature, one that suits the work and use the colours that suit the work and place the signature where it's important in the work as well. That's the cool 
purples, the purples against the yellows. Let's see how we could build a painting like this up, which could be very textural, but in this case it's a painting of mine done in Savannah. And I built it up by doing the mid-tones into the background and just working up blurred soft effects of the uh, background light first and then gradually making the stronger and lighter colours as the painting moves on, using my most intense colours and bright colours at the end. So it's just an impression of blobs of paint that gradually build up in an effective light to become a finished painting. A nice, fluid, easy, lively way of working. We can use that in watercolour to a degree as well. Here we can see the yellows being used against the purples and the opposites in the colour circle. OK, uh, I'm going to demonstrate an oil painting now of a scene actually here in France, just around the corner of the bottom of my garden. We have my usual palette of oil paints, a full palette you see of uh, all the colours that I acquire. And I'll probably only use one or two brushes on this, a couple of flats and maybe one small uh, rigger to finish off with some of the branches. I'd like to start at the horizons because that's usually about the mid-tones and I like to work out from mid-tones to light and to darks each way. I need to push the colours a little bit more because photographs are always a bit blander than reality. And I'll probably use a slightly impressionistic uh, style here of uh, blending one colour to another uh, with little strokes and also I should do some blocking and blending. In other words, I'll paint in a basic colour and then feather one colour into another. Let's look at these mid-greys around here at first. Blue-greys. Let's start with some cerulean there and add a little bit of rose to that, just to get a bit of pink. And we'll go a bit darker than we'd expect to go possibly at first, because that leaves me a chance to go lighter if I want. Let's try that colour out. Against the white canvas it looks very dark, but in fact later on it won't be as dark as that, it will look a lot lighter. I'm going to get a little bit more pink as I come up here. Now, um, as this warm comes up and around here, uh, I need a bit more of that colour. Um, the blue changes and it will gradually go from the cool cerulean blue here up into a cobalt and then around into the ultramarine a bit more life there. Right, now I want a bit stronger blue so I'm going to use the cerulean again but uh, without the pink this time. I'll put one stroke on to test it, that's fine. It's fairly yellowy here, so I'm going to put a bit down here and bring some of that neat cerulean and white across here into the paint, which is a bit warmer up here. I notice this blue that I'm putting on is a different blue to the one we've just been using. It's a, a cobalt blue, and it is a lot warmer than the surrounding cerulean. So I don't need to add too much pink to it to, to make it warmer. And the cerulean. But I will do a little bit in a minute. I need a bit of yellow with it down the bottom, but I don't need it yet. More white and two blues playing together there and making it quite vibrant. Just feathering all of those colours in now. And that's our sky done. We won't need to do any more work in that sky. Uh, it's now just a matter of working down through the various colours in the trees. While we're at it, let's look at the colours down here because I was telling you about the differences in the blues. Let's take that colour we've just done and see where it would be, somewhere around here. But in fact, um, the ceruleans aren't showing as much down in the reflections. And in this case, the reflections are much darker than the sky, as much as the, um, the ultramarines are. The ultramarine, that much warmer blue. We'll see where that comes in. It comes in down here. Yes, once you get them on, we can start to see what colours exist where, comparatively. And look at that, you see, I mean, it gives us an almost instant picture, an almost instant reflection. You have to be careful, you don't become too trite doing something like this because once you learn the techniques, it's so easy to look a, a commercial painting out, a painting that's just a very pretty, very nice, very chocolate boxy, by special effects. We're not going to be doing that, we want to go one stage further in really looking at the colours and really painting about what is there.
right into these trees. So it's warm in there, it's about pink into there in a minute. <coughs> The cobalt again. There we are. So the warm blue haze coming through into there. That's a bit too warm. So back to uh, we'll use the cobalt blue again, which is a fraction warmer, with a touch of rose in a moment. Yeah, it needs to be warmer still, so more cobalt. A touch of the rose again. A very slight purpley tint, so the cobalt and the rose are giving us that purpley tint. And it's a fraction darker than the sky, so here we go. It's in little strokes, we'll paint our way down the pine tree tips here, look. Give the effect of these just soften into that area where the mist comes through, working my way down here, mistily, just blurring it in. If I want harder edges, I'm going to have to come back on this later, if I want to make uh, less mist, I'm going to paint slightly harder edges, so I'm painting the misty trees at first, and then I should come back with some stronger colours and slightly harder edges to uh, make it some of the trees look as if they are uh, closer or, or sharper. Just blending up, feathering up. Some areas being stronger than others to give this effect of the, the mist coming into the trees here. Goes right down to the end of the tails. I think it's time that we uh, establish some of the greens here soon, but I just want to get in some of these darks, further darks down the bottom. And that will make a lot of difference to our painting, as you see. I'm using the paint still fairly thinly, not too thickly at this stage, so that I can scumble it and blend it in to make these misty effects still. Again, I'm going to work down into this area here. Let's make the uh, yellow greens of the uh, trees here first. I don't want to go too strong in colour yet, so we'll come in there with um, some yellow ochre and a little white and a touch of cerulean just to break the colour down a bit at first. Let's explore that. Yeah, that, that tone is about there, so once we've found one colour that uh, is about right, we can gradually mix the rest. That's a bit darker, yeah, that's it, that's coming up here. Through here, just using the tip of the brush to give the effects of the branches again. What happens if we use the yellow oak and a bit of white? Uh, I think we're going to need any really bright greens because this is early spring. This photograph was taken. Yeah, that's quite nice. And those lighter colours. Just put just one or two of those and so you can see what I mean. Uh, you start to play these warms in front of here. Yeah, 
Okay. Now I've got to work into these darks because uh, it really is very dark in there and that's going to make a lot of difference to this painting. So we'll take now some burnt umber, not burnt sienna, burnt umber, and some of the cobalt blue to make quite a dark. See how much warmer and dark that is. Almost too much so, so I'm going to just soften it a bit with some uh, cobalt again. Adding turps, let's see, that's better. Okay, I'll bring these darks into here. And again, give this effect of the branches coming in and things blending together. Lots of little tweaks. Let's go high speed with the camera for a while. Yeah, you know what's happening. Continue. I've given you instruction about uh, the colours I'm using and the way I'm painting and this will just speed things up. As you can see at the moment I'm just blocking in areas. That's what I'm going to do, blocking in and then using the same colours to gradually build up textures from the blocked areas. In this case I'm using the ultramarine with some raw amber, blocked in the area of the bush and the trees and then I gradually brought out the branches from that. Now I'm bringing the same colour and making small adjustments down into the reflections in the water. Okay, we're going to get this all blocked in as quick as we can. I could use a bigger brush, but uh, I'm too lazy and I'm just going to carry on slapping it on with this one half inch flat I'm using at the moment. Let's get some slightly warmer tones going into here now, look. These browns. Should bring it forward. And now temporarily back to the high speed painting, just while I do the workmanlike job of filling in the underpainting, all this background. Then with the tip of the brush, scumbling and blending in, indicating the tips of the trees, just ghosting in across the semi-wet paint, uh, the foreground trees into the middle distance there at the bottom of the hill. Once that's done, we come back again with the same thing into the reflections below. Then back to blocking in all of these white areas that remain on the canvas. As soon as we get rid of those white areas, we can then judge all of the colours one next to another and really start to make our final statements. You might notice that the dark area now that I'm painting in the foreground is warmer than the bush was behind it. I've added some more uh, burnt sienna because this is a more foreground colour, I want to draw it forward, I want the eye to be led in. And we want to be going warm, cooler, cooler, cooler on a normal landscape. So we'll leave the painting at that to dry a bit now. And I can work in more details later. Choosing the right position and the right colour for a signature can be quite difficult because it has to fit in with the painting and be a part of it. So in this case I've used a, a little bit of uh, pink just to bring it forward and hopefully match up with the weed. In fact I might even make it a little bit lighter yet because I could afford to be with a bit of cream. We need to have a little more colour down here on the left. A little darker down there on the left, I think.
Okay, we've done our work on the white ground. Now let's look at what can happen when we work onto a darker ground. Here I've worked up, a, just rubbed in with a cloth, a much darker ground onto the white canvas to start with. And we're going to do um, a scene of the same sort of uh, reflections with the same mountains in the background, but a bit further down the lake, uh, with some snow coming around here at the right hand edge and across the mountains. Um, but in this case, as I say, with a darker ground glowing through it. So for me, it's much easier to establish the mid and light tones and the colours on this rather than working to the white. I prefer it, personally. I've established some of the sky colours because I like to work on the horizon first. It's where most of the mid-tones are. In this case, actually, I've got some of the lighter ones coming in as well. And because I've already got some very dark tones here, um, I haven't got to uh, think about that too much. I can leave some of these even behind in the painting as part of the painting. So, let's work on. I'm just establishing some similar colours to the sky down here in the water. And yet again, we find uh, from this photograph that uh, the tones in the water are a little bit darker than the, the tones in the sky uh, because it's reflected light rather than being real light. Really, again, try to pull the colours out. Um, Try to look for colours and exaggerate them as much as you can, because you really need to find these to make the painting interesting. So if there's warms going on, we need to find them and uh, exaggerate them slightly, as in this case. One of the tricks with painting reflections in water is not to always paint the horizontals first. In fact, it's to go in with the depth of tones. Think as if you're looking into the depths of that water to start painting the verticals and reflections and then at the very end come across with the horizontals. Edges are very important too. You notice that where I've got the dark mountain uh, silhouetting in the water I've actually broken the colour into that dark already from the sky, giving the, the effect of the ripples coming down through the lake. This means we get a nice zigzaggy edge, not just a straight edge, which I've then got to start adjusting and painting in later. I've said before that however complicated a painting is, there is a simple method of dealing with it, and that is to paint like a jigsaw, to paint one colour in the right shape, in the right place, one against another. And if you gradually do this and make sure all of your colours are relevant one to another, as you see me doing here, then the painting will gradually just appear like a jigsaw being put together. It's fairly easy in this painting to see the warms and cools, it's easy to see the blues and the reds, but also the greys, and the greys are being made by using uh, browns and blues. By making this warmer or cooler, by using more of the brown, more of the reds, we can, uh, we can make it warmer. Or by using more blue, we make the grey cooler. And so with the variations of greeny greys, browny greys, bluey greys, we get this huge variety and beauty of warm and cool greys into the snow. Let's speed up the pace of the camera now, so that you can see the painting appearing much more quickly and fluidly. So you notice how I built up in blocks all of the underpainting, the larger colours, the larger areas of painting, and then at the end of it I gradually get more and more detailed. We go back to this way of saying paint loosely at first, paint like the jigsaw method, paint in all of your colours in the right shapes, in the right places, relevant one to another, and then gradually tighten towards the end, getting more and more detailed at the end. Don't paint your details at the beginning. Here I am now putting in the highlights of snow, the little bits of light reflecting across. And if I've worked from my darkest colours and mid-tones, then I can gradually build these up more and more and more, finishing up with the very darkest and very lightest colours. Another good basic rule to think about in watercolour and in oils is that you always start off with your largest brushes and finish with your smallest. Here you saw me starting with a one inch flat and I'm finishing up with a fine pointed round brush or a rigger to do the very fine details of twigs, branches and reflections at the end. And now to studio pieces, oil paintings done from the digital camera 
and then worked back in the studio in oil paints, working up again from our mid-tones each way out towards the light and out towards the darks, and playing the warm and cool greens as well. There are many blues in greens, you mustn't forget that. I've pre-mixed the colours again here because I love to explore the huge variety of warm and cool greens and blues that there is amongst a jungle scene like this. A scene like this really does make you aware of just how many greens are available, how much you can mix with your own colours, not just from tubes. and into my warms. Not only am I completing all of the fine details and using the rigging brush for all of the vines and the twigs, but I'm able to move towards the warm colours. I'm able to start to use this wonderful variety of oranges and, and browns that I've mixed and the golds, as you see here. Not only the mixtures of oranges and browns and golds, but coming right into almost pure, and in fact using pure uh, cadmium red, cadmium orange, and even the umbers and uh, raw and burnt sienna. This is a similar technique to the one that we use for the poppies in that it looks very complicated. To the onlooker it may seem that I've spent weeks and weeks painting all of these details but in fact it's by working up, blocking in, by working up simple tones and colours in the background and then gradually working up my details over the top giving the impression by textured strokes of masses of underpainting and then gradually finally just tickling in highlights and details on the surface. Start off with a little touch of, of white and mix with that a little bit of yellow ochre to give me a, a warm cream. There's our Sarah Lee and my different blues again. But I don't want it pure blue yet, I want it slightly greener, so I'm going to take a little bit of the, the lemon and add that in right down through here 
you can feel when I push the brush harder, when I just tickle, pushing the brush hard, push it into the canvas, or just tickle with the end of the brush like this. That will go right across the canvas now and just get rid of this white. Now let's start to blend this cloud and feather this cloud a bit at the edges, one colour into another, so that we get the cloud mistily disappearing. Now let's come back in with our fingers and we'll just mould and play with this a little. Starting with the white areas, to just soften down, just gently feeling my way across to smooth out these colours, mould them around the shapes of the clouds. We're getting rid of these brush marks now. I don't really want this particular painting. I want to have a much more photographic, smoother effect in the sky here. You can do with a brush, you can paint with a, your hands, you can paint with a cloth, with a sponge. There's so many different things we can paint with, and we don't use a bit of sponge in this painting later. There, now, I get the feeling of these clouds. Now I'm going to repeat these colours down here, but in a slightly darker tone. And then I can use my fingers again for that if I wish to. And again, just back in with the fingers gently, because I just want to soften down those brush strokes a little and make them more cloud-like. Right, well I've got my big brush, uh, I may as well continue, and uh, because you can use the edge of the brush for things as well. I'm going to go down one size and brush shortly to half this, a uh, half inch, but um, I'd like to get some of these deep reflections in here before I go on up, up the top to putting lighter colours in. And I'm going to put a thin wash of darker oil paint on here, which will soak in to put my lighter colours over to give you an idea of how we can work over underpainting. through these colours. Now I said I wanted to put a dark thin coat of paint up here to act as a, um, an underpainting. So here we have our um, burnt umber and Prussian. I want it fairly thin because I want to be able to see my drawing underneath as much as possible. Okay, we're back on the painting again. It's had uh, overnight to dry off and this layer I put on, this thin layer of glaze I put on of turps and uh, paint is now dry. Um, last night we were working a little bit wet into wet and now we can work over this and it shouldn't lift off. Um, and I'm going to now start building up these pine trees in the distance and then gradually work forward. I've gone down a size in brush now to a smaller flat with a slightly rounded edge because it's nicer than making these trees. I can just tickle them in on top here. So what I was saying about greens can be bluer or cooler or browner and warmer. The greens in the background here, these distant hills, I want to be quite cool. So I'm going to bring that blue round through here. Paint loosely and gradually tighten so that I can be as abstract as I want or I can gradually become more photographic and tighten the whole thing up. So we've got this dark green underpainting. We've got this dark green underpainting showing through underneath here. And I'm just letting the uh, blue give me the shadows in between the trees. Right down into here. Yellow green it's called, which we could mix ourselves. I mean we could mix that with um, Cerulean and Chrome, but as well I've already got it there, we'll use this one. And I want it to be a little bit cooler, so I'm going to take a little bit of 
Viridian. We'll just test it, it could be too bright. Try it down here first. Yeah, it is a bit bright. So we'll use it where the sunlight's just catching the tips of the trees here first of all. You see how we can just use the end of the brush just to flick in the sunlight coming across the trees. So this is quite a, a warm yellowy green. You can see just here, that's where we're going to be working. Just here on this area. Just letting the sunlight catch these. I want a cooler green on these. So I'm going to come back and add some more cerulean blue to this to make it quite a bit cooler in a moment. It's just going to give us what we want, I think, there. Yes, there we go, look. Quite a strong, acidic, bluey cool. Now, let's see what we get with that. A lovely colour. Can we see that the difference in those greens, the warmer greens and these cooler greens with the blue in it, a bit more cobalt. And we'll put the cool bluey greens in. Coming up through here, showing through that tree, coming right down into here. got these lovely light areas. A bit of green coming around the tree there. And if it's there, the chances are it's going to reflect in the water as well. Whatever angles and whatever happens up here will be happening down in the water a bit as well. And we're just using the end of the brush just to tickle the scumble over the surface. Yep, that's the effect we want. Just these trees catching the light. And I think we've about done the brushwork we're going to do because now I think we can start to play with uh, the sponging a bit around these areas uh, and then I'm going to put these thin branches in towards the end. So we need to make up some colour on the sponges. We have two sponges here ready to use. Of course you can tear bits off them. Now the best way I think to buy sponges for painting for watercolour or oils is to go to those seaside shops where they sell packs of little bits of sponge like this. If you go to an art shop, you'll pay pounds for just one piece. If you go to a, a cheap seaside shop with shells and things, if you pick up one of those cheap packs, you'll pick up just for a couple of pounds a whole 20, 30 of these in a little back packet. And I've chosen some here with quite big textures um, because I want to use uh, those sorts of textures on this painting. So I need to mix up some paint first. Um, what do I want? I want a bit more of the, the lighter colours here. So I'm going to take uh, plenty of white, a little touch of chrome, and a bit of lemon to make a, a nice, well, I can't, to make a nice yellowy warm because my, so I've brushed out my um, belt sienna is already in that. And I want a piece of sponge which has fairly fine texture in. That's what we got here. I think it's going to have to be this piece. Let's see what we get. There we go, you see. And we get these little bits of light.
there now that's much much nicer eh? scrape a bit bit but just scrape a bit here just just dabble but scrape it because you can use the sponge not just for dabbing but in different directions as well get the idea of reflections going on finger paint use everything to your disposal and see if we can get gently now that's right use the sponge at different angles here a golden texturing is happening up through there I think it's then about time to be using our it comes down there into here to be using our little round brush to start making final For this, just drag a bit more through there, drag, drag, drag in the branches. You see, the brush now is a blade, it's thin that way and thick that way, so I'm going to use the blade of this brush the, tip, thin, the thin edge of it to paint this tree in. I'll be using a little very light blue as well on these, not just the pink. Well, purple pink. Now, um, what we could do with really is a rigger. This is only a fine pointed brush, a rigger will give me a much, much finer line. I don't have one at the moment, which is a nuisance. what you have up there you have to have down here a little of there's bits of light coming across here as well same colour will do for some of that, I think. I'll add a bit more white to it, just a little more. We'll go for these twigs here. The end of some of these have a bit lighter. There we go. Some of the little twigs we gave the feeling of with the sponge, didn't we, by dragging it. Well, I'm now just going to add a few more with um, the brush. Um, some of these silver birches have warm and cool on the trunk, so they reflect the light silver. And the silver light is going to be from the sky which is more blue so here we have some of those blues amongst the pinks shining out same over here a little bit uh, not too much but a little bit of the light catching on the edges of these trunks little highlights around the rushes and reeds and in the water just to Show where the edges are. And take them back 
a bit of it too much. And they come through into the water here. Overdo it, it's so easy to overdo something since you've got something right. But now, at the very end of the painting, just to really establish foreground and background, And just maybe a few little orange lines here just to catch the eye and lead it in like that. Yeah. Let's see what I've done there. Much later on I decided to readjust this painting and repaint it. I totally repainted the sky in fact and many of the reflections and enhanced some of the highlights amongst the trees. You can see now how the effect I think is much bolder and stronger and far more interesting. Right, we're going to have a go at a wee portrait and I'll try and work as rapidly as I can in a very impressionistic style. I'll build up the base colours first one colour working to another. In other words, like our jigsaw way of working, we'll um, kind of get rid of the white canvas as soon as we can and just work one shape, one colour relative to another. It is because, you know, the colour you make the background will affect obviously things in the foreground. So if I make that, I mean red is the opposite in the colour circle to um, green. So if I use a bit of green in the background that's going to be quite nice against your red hair. Alright, we'll start with your hair I think fairly obviously. Uh, I won't go too colourful yet, I'm just going to go into a bit of Burnt sienna first of all, just a big brush just to get things started. Because there's a great variety of colour actually there. Um, so are you establishing the, the main base colour then? Yeah, I'm just, at the moment I'm just doing comparative colours one to another. Um, just to uh, find my way, because obviously if you finish one area, which is what amateurs often do, um, you then find that later on the colour, the areas you finished aren't right relative to the colour nearby, which is not a good idea. Getting them absolutely right. It's only an impression we want. We'll start to work some of these darks in here now. Flicks of light now can totally make a painting. So you see how I put that warmer purple on there. And around her collar. It just catches the light nicely. And the same will be happening down here. You see, I'm working across forms, not always with them. Just 
placing the colour neatly, cleanly where we need it. Nice slab of colour there. And coming down here. Now the whole thing suddenly starts to come to life. We can play some of these colours on the flesh tones too. Look at where else they are. Look at where else they are. Just an indication of them. And as I say, across, not always with the hair as we're just talking about. Look at the hair here as well. That's quite orange. Um, Come back to that colour first, bit by bit by bit. Just a little bit around her. There, so a little bit of warm coming on below the eye here. And then down this bit of the nose. Pink there, I think. I'm not getting poetical here. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, getting a bit Shakespearean, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Methinks. That makes the background yellow, of course, much paler, which was my intention. Take it or not. You can start to use this colour down here as well. I've got a mixture there actually from from this the, the uh, yellow ochre too. That's that's nice. Feel all those warms coming out there. That's really giving it some life, which is what we want. Oops. I'm using a bigger brush. I should go down brushes, really next to her painting. Do you want me to look the right way? <laughs> yes, just in a moment. Yes, thanks. I mentioned earlier that it's possible to paint acrylics over oils, never oils over acrylics. In this instance you see me painting and underpainting in acrylics, which I'll later overpaint with much stronger and more vibrant and thicker colours in oil paint. This speeds up the process greatly and means that I can finish a painting within one day that may have taken me two or three otherwise. Here's one of the finished results, with much heavier oil painting on top.
Okay, I'd like to continue to show you uh, other techniques uh, with this medium of oil painting and include in it some acrylics because acrylics are very close to oil paints in the way that they can be handled, except that they're much faster. Uh, we can put oil over acrylics or over a plastic paint, but we can't put a plastic over oil. So I'm going to paint an underpainting here for a palette knife painting I'm going to produce for you, or should I actually say a painting knife, because it'd be wrong to say palette knife. Uh, I'll, I'll explain why in a moment. We're going to do a, a painting knife painting, but rather than go straight onto the white canvas, I'm going to give it a coat of acrylic paint first. I'm going to block in my basic de deeper colours underneath, not my very darkest, but almost, uh, before using the painting knife over the top, which is a much, much quicker technique. So it's safe to put the oil paint over the acrylic, but not the acrylic over the oil paint. I've just set out a very basic palette of colours, just a few basic colours of acrylics, which I can mix up and then lay on as my underpainting, ready for the painting knife. I'm only going to need to use one brush. This nice big uh, one inch flat will do the job. I just want to cover these areas with a tone that will glow through my uh, oil painting. I'm going to paint over the top with a painting knife here. So I want to do some fairly deep purpley blues here for the light blue to shine over the top. And then the same here, some mauves into the distance. Coming down with the mauves through into some deeper greens. Uh, again, repeating these colours down into the reflections and a deeper blue here probably for the sky so that these lighter colours uh, I'm going to put over the top of our paint later will stand out and the underpainting will glow through. And it will be dry in about 10 minutes, so if I were working out of doors I could do this technique and then work very very quickly. In fact I will show you an example here where I've actually done underpainting with acrylic and then painted up with oil paint on the top with quite complicated garden scenes. And it meant that I could do very uh, complicated underpainting and block in areas before working the oil paint over the top, which has saved me probably a whole day's work. So it's a very quick technique to do. Okay, here we go then. We'll take uh, the sky first. I'll make some ultramarine blue. And as I want to cover that white canvas, then I want to uh, have a fairly thick paint. So I'm going to take some white and add that to it to build it up before adding a darker colour in. So I'm going to take some Prussian now and just, there we go, lather it on over the surface, really. We're going to put lovely pinks across here later. We haven't got to worry too much. Oh, stuffing everywhere. Very fun. Just, just to block it and get this white canvas covered so that I can put my file paint over the top afterwards. It takes a little while for the paint to dry. Uh, the fastest I've ever known acrylic to dry was when I was painting in Switzerland. And it must have been one of the hottest places I've ever painted because uh, even though I painted in Savannah and a lot of other really hot, humid places, there uh, the paint was actually drying on my brush before I could get it from the palette to the canvas. <clears throat> and this sort of painting is such fun. I mean, you know, you just let loose, just enjoy. Uh, everybody's so worried about having to make something look like something. Uh, the amount of times I keep saying it, but do people listen? You just put the right colours in the right shapes, in the right places, and like a jigsaw, the whole painting will just appear in front of you. Take some of the yellow and the blue, and just make it a basic bluey, a deep blue green here to go around the painting for the green areas. Right. Okay, it seems we're ready to start and I'm going to use these four painting knives, not palette knives remember because they're painting knives. If you notice the angled blade here allows my fingers to keep clear of the canvas. A palette knife has a straight blade. In fact I think I would recommend you're better off with these for everything, for mixing on the palette and for uh, the painting because your fingers are away from the palette then anyway. These uh, four shapes are enough for my needs here. This for doing the flat work and uh, this one is a very very interesting one from America which is not only good for doing flat work but also for uh, moulding different shapes of mountains and uh, larger slabbed areas of stone and so on and then these smaller ones for the, the fine areas and details. Right, we're going to start with the sky which is where I usually start uh, and I'm going to use my fairly large knife at the moment for this one. 
you need a fair amount of paint for this kind of work. It uh, is not like using a fine brush, so we mix up quite a lot of the material at a time. I want to start off with this cream area of the clouds here and then work into these light blues and pinks as I come down. I think I should start with the light blue areas behind and then work this cream over the top and then come down to the creams and the pinks here. So first of all then we want to make uh, a cerulean blue mix with the white. Just a little touch of the cerulean blue. Mix it up here. It's a lovely feeling painting with a, a painting knife. Nice and plastic this paint is. We're going to work onto a dark ground anyway. Mix it well up, get right down into it. It's not, not quite flat, but at a slight angle, putting the paint in front of the board and drag it across. The canvas, which uses a lot of paint this way, but it's uh, very effective. We can cut our way around this horizon. Okay, now we need to start adding some more warm to these colours, just a little of the cobalt. I next warm up from the cerulean. Start to bring that down from this far corner here. And we can drag it across, leaving some of the light blue showing underneath to give rather a nice effect of these metal clouds that we have here. We're not going to copy things exactly, this is not what I'm about, ever. It's using what is there to make a picture. Nobody knows your photograph or what you've studied. Nobody's going to come and say, oh, but it was one inch to the left, one inch to the right at that particular time. You are the artist, you are producing a, a painting that's an individual piece in its own right. cooler feeling to the rest of the sky of course. It wants to be a little smoother up there so I'm going to use the blade a bit more flatly. Right across to the palette, take some white and I need some more white soon I can see it uses so much this way of painting. And a little touch of the yellow ochre for a warm cream. Okay here we go. Put a little of the lighter cream in across this later as well and then that'll make this seem warmer. And you see how much cooler this is than this, this warmer yellow. This uh, cream here is, is quite cool compared to the... I'm not going to go much lighter than that yet though. I haven't finished yet. A lot of light on here, so... So, all we have left to do on there now are the pinks, I think. Just a little touch here and there, the warmer yellow. Uh, I'll start with the lighter uh, pink at first and see how that goes in. So I have a feeling that on the edge of some of these pinks is a little bit of mauve as well. So. You've really got to keep looking for colour, not do what you just think, it's just one colour. There, there are several colours working together here to make this work. So there we have our, our rose with some, some white. Now let's try a bit of it on the knife and see what happens. 
Right, where are we going to be? Somewhere here at first. Yeah, that's quite nice. It's fairly light, and that's what I wanted. I'll go stronger lower down just to get it started. I'm going to add a little touch of cadmium red now just to make it slightly warmer as it comes down towards the sun. And then we start to go a bit cooler with some of these and I'm going to just touch a little bit of um, this room and a small touch of my purple in. You see the lovely effects we're getting now of the cools against the warms. It isn't just pink, not by any means. But one colour helps to make another work. Right. We come on now, um, down to the water I guess, we ought to do something similar down there. Yes, it's going to have to be a lot stronger, this blue down here. Not looking where things are now, no? That mountain comes there. So we we'll have to put some more pure blues under that. Comes up here. Scrape off the paint underneath because I don't want that light colour actually showing through it. Look like I've got snow otherwise. That's not what I want here. Just scrape away the layer of paint we've got there. And then we'll put on our blue. It should stay to you, that's right. So, uh, Working our way along these greens now again, looking at the reflections happening down here. You have a bush there, it's got to reflect here. We did that with the reflections in the autumn scene. Yeah, that's very dark area here. There we have it. in these final tones.
walking along here we have a nice little bush here and you have a bush there it's got to reflect here we do that with our reflections in the autumn scene something floating in the, the water here so I'll put a little dark line in there just to give an indication of surface again just want to look at some of the pinks here just coming into the reflections Here we are again, last painting on the island, beautiful sandy bay on the uh, island of Harris and uh, we've got a nicer morning this morning to try and oil. I've only got two hours before we've got to get back to the ferry so I've got to try and do this 24-30 canvas in two hours. That's going to take some work and some speed. We'll have a bit of fun and we'll give it a try. My last chance here for a bit. Let's go for it now, shall we? Thank you. 
now back at La Parade, well I've been looking forward to trying to paint some of my garden for some time. I've got some beautiful flowers that come out here and these poppies uh, have just sprung up and uh, the trouble is that trying to get a perfect composition <laughs> it's very difficult. Um, so I'm going to go in fairly close to the poppies and have them along the bottom border and try and play with the shapes and light and colours of the different greens behind um, to make more of a pattern of this. And to use a white canvas this time and oils. And uh, it's a beautiful place to work of course here with all the birds you can hear in the background. Shouldn't be too much traffic today. Let's have a go at this one. So this is my scene and the sun's going to come round onto it. So I'm going to go for the background first, paint all the mid tones, some of the darker tones. White canvas that I've just drawn the design out on. A camping stool and uh, a few brushes and of course my plastic palettes full of paint and ready to go with some turps. I think we'll start off with quite a big brush, one inch flat. Oh, look at these background colours here, the difference between the yellows and the bluey greens there. I say there's a lot of blue in my paintings. I don't think so particularly but I do tend to look very carefully at uh, the differences between distant colours and closer colours. So I'm going to use some cerulean and lemon yellow and white to start this off up here. You can paint the colours thinly of course but I don't want it to be too transparent. Let's use it all up. Give us the effect of our, our misty distance. Got some strong yellows in there. I'm going to add a bit of mauve into it. Go into the shadows. Those background trees. Just tickle with the tip of the brush. And I'll take a little bit of brown now, Van Dyke brown, to warm up into those shadows a little bit there. And we play the cools off against the warms then. Talking of which, now we need to look at these dark dark trees here, these dark shapes here, above the flowers. Let's go in with a medium tone there. Cobalt, take some cobalt blue. Look at those colours. blue and some brown and uh, a little bit of emerald green. Let's get in there and fill up these shapes. Having got that I can go back to my lighter colours of the leaves and use some of that same colour just to catch on some of these leaves here in the foreground that are catching the sunlight. And slightly cooler colours. Full of light, full of life. And for me an impressionist, well this is nice. And uh, that again is going to be a slightly purpley mauve. A little bit of rose with that. What have we got? It's in cool shadow here. And it's playing behind this. Some nice warms in a moment down there. some gorgeous darks down in behind here and as we start to establish those then the lighter colours appear lighter and so on. A 
and there really are some lovely colours going on behind here. Catching these fence posts. See now the, the sunlight has come round onto the flowers, so I'm going to have to uh, get these darks as quickly as I can in to then continue and get the flowers painted. Alright, I need to establish some of these mid greens now, which are much warmer, so I'm going to take some of my emerald and um, some yellow ochre and establish some of these warmer poppy greens mid-tones here sunlight coming around behind before I start to actually paint in any real detail on them just to establish where they are now we'll put in some cobalt amongst those cools to Further take that back under here before we come out with the warmer colours. Now back to that warmer green I was making with the yellow ochre. Remember we're still on a nice big one inch brush here, just blocking in these areas to get rid of all these bits of white. I really don't want to get rid of as quickly as I can. Can't see what I'm doing with all this white in the way. Some plants and stuff landing in there. Don't worry about any of that, you just enjoy. Really find these sunlit colours, bring them out. Right, what colour is this iris basically? Huh? Let's have a look. We need some yellow ochre in there, I think. Put the drawing out a bit yet. Be more of a lemon yellow. It's a very difficult uh, iris, a beautiful, beautiful iris. It's a very unusual iris. And we've got to now put one colour against another to try and find this colour of this iris. some of these poppy oranges in too. Take my cadmium yellow at first, just spread that in there until I get my drawing done with the poppy again. Pure, pure uh, cadmium yellow. Lock the paint on, so we're painting fat on lean here, we've got a leaner colour underneath and I'm painting these heavy slabs of colour onto here now. While I'm establishing that yellow, it's also showing me what the iris needs. I've got a slight problem now because the sun is coming around onto the canvas. I may have to move the canvas slightly otherwise I can't see what I'm painting. What pinks is that going up behind there in a moment? Let's just a few of my lighthouse. Right now we're
So this is my chrome yellow and some cadmium orange and some white which is giving me this lovely orange I want for the edge of the iris there. start to establish some of these oranges in the poppies so while they're there we need to really catch the sunlight and start to feel the beauty of these using some rose. And again just moulding the paint about as if it's plastic. I mean, oil paint is a very plastic paint. It's a very plastic art. these poppies. I haven't yet used the cadmium red, which is a cooler red. It will give me the shadows inside these poppies quite nicely. Look at the difference that makes, you see, compared to the orange that I used earlier. So the deep purple there and whatever on the other, on the rest of them. You see how that establishes those poppies a lot more strongly. And we can go darker still. I want to take some of the ultramarine now into that blue into that purple and really establish that as well. Really get in there and make things sing. And even the Prussian blue, which is much, much darker and blacker, can go into the centre. Remember here. Now you see the difference that's made. Now I've got to turn the canvas again as the sun comes around. Let's work on this iris a bit. Get rid of these light bits that we don't want. Really look for these colours. Pointy brush because I want to make some much lighter designs. These very light stems coming down and through here in places. So 
sun's coming round onto the painting again already it's moving so quickly and this is why you've got to work fast on a painting like this because you need to catch the light that exists. We're basically painting highlights now. We're making our painting by using, by painting with highlights on all the little bits of leaf. Now oh, what have we got? We need to start working on some of the really darks as well. Now we've got some lovely, we've got some purples coming in there amongst those big leaves as well, reflecting off the light. Keep looking for these colours, don't stop if there's a light green here that I wouldn't have noticed. But... Colours very easily get muddy at this stage. Got a mucky palette going. We don't want that. So we're almost there now I think, we just have to work on one or two of the details of the stems. Well there we are, it's taken me about three hours, longer than I usually take, um, and the sun's been coming around all the time. I'm tempted to do a little more, and then I'll show you the final photograph. Yes, for me it's really now the darks that we need picking up and uh, make these lights stand out. Well, there we are, that's it for this painting. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it showed you another quick way of painting in Plyno, this time on a white canvas.